Welcome to a virtual version of the Lord's Day service for March 3rd, 2024. This is the first, or, or this is the third week in Advent. Uh, I'm going to start by reading some scripture, a reading from 1 Corinthians 1. Here, uh, with the, uh, <laughs> here what the Spirit is saying to the church. For the message is about the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise and the discernment of the discerning I will thwart. Where is the one who is wise? Where is the scribe? Where is the debater of this age? Has not God made foolish wisdom of the world? For since in the wisdom of God, the world did not know God through wisdom, God decided through the foolishness of our proclamation to those who believe. For Jews demand signs and Greeks desire wisdom, but we proclaim Christ crucified, a stumbling block to Jews and foolishness to Gentiles. But to those who are called, both Jews and Greeks, um, Christ, the power of God and wisdom of God. For God's foolishness is wiser than human wisdom and God's weakness is stronger than human strength. And our next reading is from John, John chapter 2. Hear what the Spirit saying to the church. The Passover of the Jews was near, and Jesus went up to Jerusalem. And in the temple, he found people selling cattle and sheep and doves and the money changers seated at their ta tables. Making a whip of cords, he drove all of them out of the temple, both the sheep and the cattle. He also poured out the coins of the money changers and overturned their tables. He went... To uh, he told those who were selling the doves, take these things out of here. Stop making my father's house into a marketplace. His disciples remembered it uh, as it was written, zeal for your house will consume me. The Jews then said to him, what signs can you show for, for doing this? Jesus answered them, destroy this temple and in three days I will raise it up. And the Jews said, this temple has been construct, under construction for 46 years, and you will raise it up in just three days. But he was speaking of the temple of his body. And after he was raised from the dead, his disciples remembered that he had said this, and they believed the scripture and the word that Jesus had spoken. And then there's another gospel reading, um, and this is about the, uh, the Canaanite woman. And this is from Matthew 15. Hear what the Spirit saying to the church. Jesus left that place and went away to the district of Tyre and Sidon. Just then, a Canaanite woman from that region came out and started shouting, Have mercy on me, Lord, son of David. My daughter is tormented by a demon. But he did not answer her at all. And his disciples came and urged him, saying, Send her away. She keeps shouting after us. And he answered, I was sent only to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. But she came and knelt before him, saying, Lord, help me. And he answered, It is not fair to take the children's food and throw it to the dogs. She said, Yes, Lord, even the dogs eat the crumbs that fall from their master's table. Then Jesus answered her, Woman, great is your faith. Let it be done for you as you wish and her daughter was healed from that moment. These are the words of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Wow, Jesus was sure angry. A whip of cords, uh, driving them out, shouting at the vendors in the, in the temple, flipping the tables, dumping out the coins. He seems out of control. He's filled with anger. And this is a very human reaction to being enraged. Um, each of us can identify with that, with that one way or another. So different than the self-controlled Jesus that we see throughout the rest of the Gospels. Whenever you see Jesus in the movies, um, he seems so serenely, like he's almost floating around most of the time. He's calm and he has a soft glow on his face, framed with that smooth flowing hair. So which one is it? Did Jesus float or did he stumble? Was his anger divine, reflecting the anger of God the Father, or was he angry at their hypocrisy as a human by defiling the temple with that crass commercialism that they had? 
The question is deeply important, deeply profound, because it gets at who Jesus was. Many Christians easily rationalize the dual nature of Jesus in flipping the tables. They say, of course, Jesus had righteous anger, but it was foreordained. He needed to show the people God's anger at their sinfulness. This is Jesus showing his stern judgment, people will say. Jesus was in complete control of his emotions. Of course he was. He was demonstrating God's will, there, therefore. In other words, it was all very neat and clean. No problem. We've got all this figured out, don't we? The story is at the beginning of Jesus' ministry in John, but uh, it's at the near the end of um, in Mark, Ma Matthew, Mark, and Luke. The same story, and he, in fact, in Mac Matthew, Mark, and Luke, it's uh, after he enters Jerusalem on Palm Sunday, which is kind of weird. Why is there such a big difference between uh, between the different gospels and these? bookends of Jesus' ministry. In Matthew, Mark, and Luke, this is what gets Jesus in trouble with a high priest and gets him uh, them starting to think about crucifying him. Each account uses practically, practically the same language. It looks like maybe it was from a single source, and Jesus quotes scripture as, as if his anger was just an act and he just needed to get noticed, and he needed to fulfill that scripture that he was quoting. Now, if Jesus was a real person, he would have been afraid, and he would have wondered what kind of mess he got into. Maybe his anger got out of hand, maybe he thought. Maybe he doubted that he did the right thing. And many of these passages, if you look at it that way, and if you look at it the this sort of if you don't look at it that way, that he wasn't had a human reaction, then maybe it was just all an act. In John, he seems much angrier than in the other three gospels. He's less serene. He doesn't quote scripture in John at all. It's only his disciples remembering a scripture afterwards, and in fact it was a scripture about rage. And it's a lot less stilted, and it seems more real, like a more real account in John. And it doesn't have the same cosmic consequences. It's not what causes the temple hierarchy to be mad at Jesus no, or in order to pursue him. It's not nearly as neat and clean as it is in the other three Gospels, which is really weird and odd because John is usually the most ethereal and mystical of the Gospels. But we can see Jesus' humanity peeking through in John many times in the narrative. In Matthew, uh, in Matthew, I read about the Canaanite woman. And this doesn't allow us to dismiss Jesus' humanity so easily and reconcile it with Jesus' divine nature as easily as the, um, the cleansing of the temple. In fact, I think this is where most Christians get Jesus all wrong, is, and you can see it in this passage. In January, I went to a lecture and a panel discussion at the Seattle School of Theology and um, Psychology, which is in Belltown near Seattle. And, I was led, and it was led by Dr. Angela Parker, uh, who is a foremost womanist scholar of the New Testament. Um, and she's just amazing. So she gave the perspective of this story from that being a black woman and seeing how Jesus' encounter with the uh, Canaanite woman is something that she could identify with. It's the same story as the Syrophoenician woman in Mark 7. So it's the slightly different words, but pretty much the same story. And John is a little bit more full, uh, or uh, Matthew is a little bit fuller account. Why was Jesus so rude? He was. He totally ignored the Canaanite woman. And when she was crying out, he ignored him. And then the disciples are kind of like, you know, come on, Jesus, let's get rid of her. And he said, no, don't even bother. That's, that's not even worth your effort to do that because I'm for those who are saved <laughs> or I'm for the Jews, I'm not for her. Because as a foreign woman, 
she had no standing. No standing, even with Jesus. Only after pestering him a number of times, and when her pestering becomes unavoidable, Jesus hurls an insult at her. And it was not uncommon for foreigners at the time to be called dogs by Jews because they were thought to be perpetually unclean. When the woman answers very cleverly back to Jesus, Jesus then he praises her and he relents in healing um, her daughter. Again, most people will see this as a test and they'll see this as a sign and they'll see this as part of his instruction maybe to the disciples and to the others around them. Jesus was just doing what divine Jesus did, right? He already knew. But that's not what the text says. And when you look deeply at the text, you can see there's no indication whatsoever that Jesus knew, knew what was going to happen. When we add that divineness to this, um, to this text, we're just laying, we're laying meaning on top of the text instead of reading what's there. We're, we're uh, pretending to know what's in Jesus' mind. Dr. Parker posits that this is where Jesus himself was learning a lesson rather than teaching a lesson to others. It was part of his growth in becoming the Messiah rather than something that was preordained. What Jesus did and said at first marginalized the woman. Calling her a dog is a racist, racist slur. It's very similar to what we would say if we were saying a racist thing to someone. Ignoring her twice was avoidance. It was making her unimportant, unworthy of his attention. From a black woman's perspective, she says, this is all too familiar. How could being rude ever be a test or a lesson? When you look earlier in Matthew, in chapter 1, Jesus himself is a descendant of several marginalized foreign women. Tamar, Ruth, Rahab are explicitly listed in his genealogy. In seeing the Canaanite woman face to face, Jesus was coming face to face with his own identity. The woman's response, in fact, shows how much she had been conditioned all of her life to see herself as a lesser person, especially by the Jews. This is also something that uh, Dr. Parker, as a black woman, can only know in her heart when she sees this. Was Jesus unkind to her? Wasn't he just following a social norm of the Jews? Maybe we can see it differently. Did Jesus learn from this experience? Isn't it just an expression of Jesus' humanity in reacting this way and in changing because of it? Why, can, uh, why can't he lose his temper in the temple? Why isn't it that he, that was another human reaction? If he lo loses his temper in the temple, then why can't he, uh, you know, and he's the strong warrior, some people say, because of this thing in the temple. Why isn't it that he's not insensitive and dismissive of the Canaanite woman? It just makes him look bad, doesn't it? People can get very angry at these questions, and they do. Um, I've had responses like this, and when I see their anger, I wonder why their threat, why their faith is so threatened by seeing Jesus as a real human being. The story goes to the heart of Christology. Christology is that who Jesus is, who Jesus was and is, and to reconcile that rude, maybe bigoted response from Jesus with his divinity can be hard to do. It should be hard because it gets to the heart of whether we think Jesus was a real living human being. People who think Jesus had foreknowledge of the Canaanite woman and that this was only a testing will cry, Jesus was perfect. He knew everything. He was sinless. But when I ask, did Jesus grow and learn? 
Was Jesus born with this perfect knowledge? In other words, did he know everything that was going to happen to him? Does making a mistake and learning from it, is that a sin? I, and when I say these things, I usually get no response. Is Jesus fully human or not? That's really the question. Well, he was a 30-year-old man with skills. He was building things. We know that. And he was making a living. We know that. He didn't get frustrated? Of course he did. Did he get tired? Did he um, smash his thumb with a hammer sometimes and curse? We know that he cursed a fig tree, a fig tree that didn't deserve it. <laughs> but if these, are not, if these aren't signs of Jesus being a real man, then what are? These two stories, the cleansing of the temple and the Canaanite woman, must be taken also with two other major parts of the gospel story. Jesus' temptation in the wilderness and his suffering in the Garden of Gethsemane. If Jesus had perfect knowledge and perfect faith, then his temptation wasn't really temptation at all. It was just a show, just to show people. If Jesus didn't have doubts and fears in the garden, then his suffering was a lie. Just, an, just another show, again. If he was absolutely certain of who he was and that he, in a way that no human could be, then he wasn't a real man. The Nicene Creed spells out the two doctrines that all Christians should agree on. One, that God is three personas in one substance, the Trinity. And two, that, God, that Christ was fully human and fully divine at the same time. This is the basic orthodoxy of, a profess, of the professing church and of professing Christians. As your pastor, these are the only two things that I must profess in order to be ordained. They are the foundations of the faith. All other doctrines, all other things about the church are, are up for debate. The confessions are up for debate. How we interpret scripture can be up for debate as well. But these two things are the basis of, of our belief system. A major heresy in the early church was called docetism. And this is the idea that Jesus wasn't really human, that he was a, just a divine spirit that gave the illusion of being a real human being. And it was almost like he was a very realistic ghost, according to the docetists. The early church fathers had the wisdom uh, to denounce this as a heresy because it didn't make sense to have an illusionary savior. But strangely, this idea keeps creeping up over and over again, it keeps creeping back into our Christianity, making the Jesus with the capital letter He that we often uh, use uh, somehow far above us, not really a human being. And in fact, it's so widespread that today, many Christians today have that problem. They have a problem seeing Jesus as a real human being. Jesus must be human in every way. When we say that he was without sin, that doesn't mean perfection. And that doesn't mean learning without making mistakes. It doesn't mean not cursing or getting frustrated or tired or angry. Sin means malice toward God's will, not these other things. Last month, I preached a sermon uh, entitled, God Changes, that, and I said at that time that God's basic character of justice, mercy, steadfast love is constant and unchangeable in God, because that's who he is. But that we also believe that God is affected by us and changes, uh, changes God's mind, that our prayers actually matter that God's foundational love could mean nothing else, another, nothing else other than this. 
The changeable God, affected by love toward his creation, is the only God worth loving, honestly. And in the same way, a human Jesus is the only one worth loving, too. That Jesus' divinity is totally linked with his humanity. And that gives us hope for redemption and resurrection. A disembodied Jesus, just an illusionary human, can't be our savior, can't do any of this. As we approach Easter, we need to decide for ourselves who Jesus is again. If this is the best Lenten practice we can do. So as we're going through Lent, think about this. Are we going to keep Jesus at arm's length? Or are, are we going to have a Jesus who doesn't stumble, who isn't hurt, isn't angry, doesn't get frustrated? Are we going to have that Jesus, a not real human Jesus? A Jesus who goes to the cross without doubt? A Jesus who pl uh, prays in the garden only to avoid pain? Is not a real Jesus, is not the one I want to believe in. I would go as far to say that this is a heretical Jesus. This is not the Jesus of the Nicene Creed because he must be fully human as well as divine. Personally, I find this Jesus very comforting. The real Jesus is the one that I can have confidence in. Jesus in the bread and in the wine. Here at the table in front of us, this table is where we meet the real human Jesus as well. And this is the real human Jesus that can identify with me in all of my pains and doubt, in all of my pains of doubt and doubts of, as a human being. In a few weeks, we will recollect the living, breathing Jesus as he walks through the eastern gate of Jerusalem, filled with terror, but also filled with determination. Who knew? He knew that there was probably no escape but he also knew that there was no other way that he could be true to himself than going through that gate. When Paul talks about the foolishness of the cross, this is what he's talking about. He says, for we proclaim Christ crucified. The reason it's a stumbling block for the Jews is because they couldn't imagine how God could be a man in, in, that, in that uncleanliness, especially the uncleanliness and defilement of the cross. Foolishness for the Gentiles, for them, they couldn't see how a god sitting on Mount Olympus would ever want to suffer the pain and indignity of being a human being. Christ crucified is the real Jesus. God with us, somebody who's like me, who learns, who sees himself in the eyes of another human being, and even who, even a human being who is ignored and despised, like the Canaanite woman, and a Jesus that changes his mind and learns from his mistakes. In looking into the Canaanite woman's eyes, he's the one that has compassion to heal one and all. Let us pray. Loving God, one who is affected by us, not ignoring us, who re, who's not repelled by us, not one who turns away. Restore our connection with the human Jesus in our Lenten journey. In communion today, let us take the fully human Jesus into our bodies, into our hearts, and into our minds. Let us claim your restoring grace for all humankind in body and and in the name and in the body and the blood of Christ we pray amen